It was the day of the protagonist's wedding, and she couldn't believe herself that the lordship was going to marry her. As she was in the church, someone commented on her that she was so beautiful, but they wondered why the groom hadn't arrived there yet. They whispered that they felt bad for the bride, and someone said that he hadn't seen the groom earlier as well. Abelina thought they were all looking at her and she wanted to run away from there. She then remembered the time when a baby girl was born in the Marquess's family, and she was so pretty that she seemed like she was made of pink cotton candy and was so loved by her parents and grew so well. But she was a little more like the cotton candy because she was so timid and weak-minded. She faced a lot of difficulty talking to people, and she would get to read books beside having tea parties or any other things held by other young ladies. Her parents worried a lot about her but also loved her and embraced her timidity with love. However, the day had come when she had to attend a debutante ball. Any excuse would work there, but she had to attend that ball, so she held back her tears and arrived there. She received a great welcome there. Abelina was the female head of the betrayal of the black horse. She presented herself more radiantly than others and felt like she was inside the world of a novel. She remembered that she had either taken a record in the novel world or had been transmigrated there. In her past life, she had been the same, timid and weak-hearted, and even small things made her scared. Talking with people was especially overwhelming, and she knew she had to change, so she read tragic novels to try to gain courage. In the end, she was reborn as Nadia Vine, a female secondary character in the novel. She wondered what had happened and whether she should have ever read that novel. There were scenes throughout which depicted an aged guy reaching, but she mustered her courage and read that around 50 times. When she realized that she was in that novel, something came to her mind in the real story. She was Nadia and got her throat slit, dying. As she was in the church, waiting for her groom, a man approached her and said that it seemed like the groom would be late and that he would act on his behalf. So let's start the process of the wedding. All the people just stared at him. Abelina felt flustered but agreed to start the process. She thought that it was right and she needed to ensure that the ceremony would be held. If that had been the old her, she would have already run away from there, but she had her reasons to stay. After the debutante ball, her parents died suddenly, so her uncle took the title, and she became broke. Even her life was at risk. Due to all those things, she left the capital and afterward, she didn't have any other choice but to get married. And that's why the wedding was to be done. Father spoke out that he trusted them both to love each other and did the groom's proxy, and the bride swore to be faithful to their wedding vows. So they both agreed to that. Then the man asked them to sign the written oath to conclude their wedding ceremony, and the bride would start. A child gave her the pen to sign there. She thought to sign and get out of there, meaning she could escape from those people's eyes. But she was certain people would mock her for getting married without a groom. She then looked at the door, but there was no one there. So she signed the oath paper. She signed as Nadia and thought it would be the last time she signed with that name. Then the man told the groom to sign there. A kid gave him the pen to sign, and as he signed, Nadia thought that with that, it was confirmed that she would become a bride abandoned by her groom on their wedding day. Just then, the door opened, and the real groom arrived, stating that it seemed like he was very late. As he stepped inside, everyone got scared to see his condition. Nadia wondered who he was and just then caught a smell, covering her nose and said that it was like the smell of metal. She saw that the real groom was covered in blood on his face and dress. The novel Betrayal of the Black Rose was a tragic romance fantasy novel where they read about casualties every time they turned a page, and Nadia was the person who was born into it. She remembered everything about the evening debutante ball. Nadia thought that if it wasn't for her hair, she wouldn't have known what her role was. She had numerous supporting characters around her, and there wasn't anything special about her besides her hair. However, even a small side character like her got beheaded, and she knew that death was waiting for her in the future. So, there was only one answer to leave that capital. As Nadia stood on the balcony, she thought that normally when they were reborn into a noble, their world hardly changed their destiny. But that only happened in novels, and she trembled in fear from reading the tragic novels. She wondered if she could prevent the tragedies in the original novel. The pendulum of fate wasn't swinging yet, and if she left the capital before all hell broke loose, she could avoid death. Just then, Melly came to call her and ask Nadia what she was doing there all alone because the debutante ball was held by Nadia herself. Nadia replied that she was a bit scared. Melly considered Nadia a scaredy cat and mentioned that if Melly were in Nadia's place, she would have enjoyed herself a lot more. She then asked Nadia to let's head inside as Uncle was looking for her as well. Nadia declined and said that she would stay there a bit longer. Melly agreed and, upon entering, commented that Nadia was so annoying. The scene shifts to three years after that debutante ball. 
Nadia was sitting in her room when Meli entered and exclaimed that she had heard Nadia was getting married. Upon hearing this, Nadia confirmed it. Meli told her that it was a surprise and mentioned that after Nadia's parents had passed in a carriage accident, Meli thought Nadia would continue to sponge off them since Meli's father was the Marquess. Meli continued that Nadia was so bad at socializing and was totally broken, and her face wasn't either. So, Meli guessed that getting married fast was the best option for Nadia. But as she was a broken noble lady who had all her wealth taken from her, the only way to leave the capital was to get married, and she was so scared of getting married, but that's a million times better than getting beheaded. When a nuisance of a niece told her uncle that she wanted to get married and leave the family, her uncle got so excited and found a prospective groom for her. She was told that it was the Lord of Aylesford, who was a man around her age whose only asset was a territory in the poor countryside located at the east end of the empire. Nadia thought that he had agreed to take her, even though her dowry was so small and maybe she should be thankful to him. Meli asked Nadia if she had heard that the man was totally broken, and the man whom Nadia was going to marry was so poor that his name was Baron Beggar, so would Nadia want to marry such a person? The eastern borders were known to be barren lands. Nadia agreed with Meli. Meli thought that Nadia's reaction was so boring, and then she told Nadia that the man was an ugly eunuch. Startled, Nadia asked if that was for real. Meli agreed and told Nadia not to be sad. Meli didn't think Nadia would even spend one night with him, and she thought he was disabled so he wouldn't be able to walk well. And since his health was so bad, he could die any time. Nadia could enjoy her life afterward with her inheritance, but that man was a beggar. Laughing, Meli asked Nadia what she was going to do. Nadia thought it seemed like the man she expected her uncle had found was worse than that. But to her, the most important thing was to get married so fast. She then stopped reminiscing, and the real groom with blood on his body stood in front of her. She was shocked to see him and thought that she was suffering from a phobia that made her pass out when she saw blood. That's because whenever she saw that crimson color, she recalled a memory that she wanted to forget but couldn't. However, she couldn't pass out currently, and it was a matter of her life and death. She tried to pull herself together to avoid passing out there. She raised her head and, looking at the man, wondered who he was. Just as the fake groom referred to him as Lord, she wondered about that and thought if he was the owner of that image and her husband as well. She remembered that Meli had said Nadia's husband was disabled and couldn't walk, but the man standing in front of her was totally different. She wondered what to do next. The real groom got close to her, and she just got scared, so she closed her eyes. There was just silence, so she opened her eyes to see. She then found that he was wiping the blood. Nadia thought, why does that feel like deja vu when she had never seen him before? And she felt like she had seen him somewhere. The fake groom told the leader that it wasn't late yet, so just sign the oath. As the leader agreed, he took out the gloves and signed there. Nadia thought that even though her groom was late, she was glad. In any case, all the things Meli said were wrong. She had told Nadia that her groom was ugly, but he was so handsome. Rather than being disabled, he seemed perfectly fine, albeit covered in blood. How foolish was she to believe her when she knew all the things Meli told were lies only? And then she saw the name of that man. She realized it was Altair, and now she understood what deja vu was all about the jet black hair, ruby-like crimson eyes, and a mole under his left eye. Altair looked so cold-hearted and sharp, but he had such an impressive appearance. He was the most brutal character in the novel, the lunatic villain Duke, the one who beheaded Nadia. She was just shocked and wondered what he was doing there. Nadia remembered that she had read the novels many times, so she was certain that the man had been later bestowed a new surname, Gertrands, for the huge contributions he had made on the battleground, and had become a duke. And after that, as the novel went, he got rid of all the new foes, and she was so fixated on leaving the capital that she totally forgot that the villains had originally been noblemen from the border area, but no one would know that the man referred to as Baron Beggar was the villainous duke of the future. She was totally screwed, and that was no different from having entered a tiger's den while trying to avoid that, and in her first life, she died in a car accident, and currently, a lunatic villain would behead her in her second life, and her only fate was to die. And that was so unfair, she just wanted to live a normal life and die a normal death like other people. But she just thought to be calm, and a villain couldn't be a villain from their birth, and the original novel was yet to begin, so either he would rehabilitate him so that he didn't become a villain. She wondered why she couldn't picture Yang and let herself look at his face again. As she looked, she became scared and wondered why he was glaring at her like that. Then she looked at all the people and wondered why they were all silent. Altair arrived covered in blood, which made her wonder even more. The fake groom asked Altair if he had gotten rid of all those people. 
Altair agreed and mentioned that he had checked that none of them were breathing. Nadia was shocked to hear that. Altair continued, stating that he had left one of them alive to make sure they talked. The man agreed with him. On the other side, Nadia was trembling upon hearing these things. Altair told her to just watch herself from there. She apologized and asked for his pardon. He explained that she should keep it together and not act like a fool, or she would die immediately. He warned her not to make him clean his wife's corpse with his own hands and asked if she understood. She thought that Altair was a proper villain even before the novel began. And just like that, she fell there. The scene shifted to the eastern territory of the Loop's empire, Aylesford Castle. There, Altair was standing, but Nadia was in a faint condition, and a doctor was checking her. Altair asked what had happened to her. The doctor replied that it seemed she was exhausted due to the rough return journey and there were some secret issues, so he didn't have to worry about that. Confused, Altair wondered if people passed out even when they were tired, as he hadn't heard of something like that in his life. The doctor replied that unlike Altair, normal people could be like that, and in particular, Nadia seemed physically weak, so that meant Altair had to pay more attention to her. Altair glared at him and, being angry, said that he got himself a high-maintenance bride. The doctor got scared and, packing his things, prescribed some medicines to help Nadia regain her strength before leaving. As the doctor left, Blan called Altair and requested him to change his way of speaking. Altair asked Blan what was wrong with his speech. Blan, a bit scared, replied that Altair spoke to everyone in an aggressive manner, which even men would find intimidating. Altair asked Blan what he was talking about, as he was trying his hardest to be as friendly as he could. Blan denied this and said that Altair needed to change his approach. Altair asked what the problem was, as he hadn't cursed anyone. Blan explained that the language Altair used seemed like commands, which didn't sit well with Nadia. He advised Altair to be more affectionate towards her, to be grateful to her, and not to threaten her. Altair glanced at Nadia and said that he was already affectionate and had even captured those who chased her because they wanted to kill her. However, they were the reason why others chased her, and he was sure that Valhale had sent those people. Blan commented that Altair didn't have any air with him, but when they heard that he was getting married, they went after Altair's future wife. Then Bland suggested not to forget why Altair was getting married and that he must produce an heir as soon as possible. Seeing that it was already late, Bland recommended having a meal with her the next day or preparing the meal by himself for her. He also suggested putting together a banquet in the evening so she would feel better, and he advised Altair to approach her first as a human and then as her husband. Altair shouted that he knew all of this and asked if he looked like a fool. Bland, seeming devoted, said that if Altair could do something, they would help him as well. As Blan left, he asked if Altair had spent the night with Nadia. Angered, Altair asked how Blan dared to ask such things. Blan indicated to be quiet, otherwise Nadia would wake up, and if Altair looked like that, she would get scared as well. Altair seemed angry with Blan, and as he heard a noise, he turned towards Nadia to watch over her. Blan seemed happy and mentioned that it was the first time for Altair. Altair became even more angry, and Blan asked for forgiveness before leaving the room. The next morning, Nadia woke up and wondered what was going on there. She looked at her pale face in the mirror and thought that she was in a mess, and it was like she was looking at her future. Just then, she looked around the room and realized that it was spotless, tidy, and so clean it seemed like no one had come there the whole night. She wondered if she had been abandoned on her wedding night. She sat there, feeling relieved but also hungry. She found it amusing that she felt hungry in such a situation, but in reality, it wasn't amusing it meant she was alive and needed to pull herself together and do things correctly. She reminded herself that she was the one who decided to leave the capital, who chose marriage as a means to do so, and who accepted the man picked by her uncle to get married to. It was all her choice, and now wasn't the time to tremble in fear like that. She then took a deep breath, relaxed, and decided to first go eat something. After that, she would have the strength to start whatever needed to be done. She looked at the door, hoping for someone to come, but as she grew frustrated, she thought it was odd that no one had come, especially since meals were one thing, but there was no one coming to help her get dressed. She wondered if the servants knew what had happened at the wedding and if they were ignoring her because she hadn't been welcomed by their master. Things seemed no different there, and she felt unwelcome. This reminded her of her past when her family got into an accident. As she woke up, she found herself injured and lying on the bed, with her uncle sitting next to her. He told her there had been a carriage accident. When she asked about her parents, her uncle replied that he had heard they hadn't made it. Upon hearing this, Nadia felt deeply disappointed and began to cry. Her uncle grabbed her hand and said he knew she was upset, 
but she had to listen carefully because from that day forward, he would be inheriting the Marquis title. Nadia was shocked to hear that. Uncle continued that, as she was already aware, there wasn't any other choice according to the current law, and he could send her away from there quickly, but that would be too cruel. Nadia thought that, like that, she went from being the beloved only daughter of the Marquess to a leech of a niece who sponge off the family. Naturally, the servants started ignoring her, and she didn't even get the dowry that she deserved. Nadia stopped reminiscing and, lying down, thought that it wasn't that surprising that no one came. She was a bride who wasn't only neglected on her wedding day, but she was also the one who brought the small dowry, yet they should at least feed her. Just then, someone knocked on the door, and Nadia was happy that someone finally came. As she told them to come inside, Altair entered, stating that she had finally awoken. She was shocked and wondered who was there. As Altair entered, he brought the food, and Nadia was shocked to hear why she was there and why he wasn't going to tell her to leave. Altair didn't say a single word, he simply placed the food on the table and stood at a distance. Nadia wondered what was going on and why he was suddenly doing things like bringing food, wondering if it was for her. She became excited when she saw the food and, standing up, grabbed it with both hands. Altair asked her if she was going to eat that while standing. She stopped and said she should first sit down. Immediately, she sat down but didn't start eating. Altair urged her to eat before the food got cold. She agreed and started eating, thinking it was so good. It wasn't just delicious because she was hungry, it was perfectly soft and just the right amount. She wondered what the soup would taste like. Taking a sip, she found it rich in flavor and couldn't stop eating, starting to wonder who made it. She noticed that Altair was looking at her and felt like someone was watching her. She wondered when he had gotten so close to her. Then she coughed and wondered if she wasn't supposed to eat, thinking maybe he was watching to see if she left any food he had brought. She told him that she was eating and continued to do so. As Altair glared at her, she said that it was delicious, getting emotional as she spoke. As she ate her food, she thought that she hadn't felt so good because she had eaten so fast, but why was he still there even though she had finished her food? She then asked if there was something he wanted to say, and if not, she apologized for that, and he kept staring at her. He then glared at her, and she apologized to him because that was a foolish question. She thought that he was so angry and didn't know why, but he was so angry and she should apologize to him, and for that, she got on her knees, trembling. Altair talked about dinner and she could have that downstairs and heard everyone had worked hard to prepare a welcome dinner party for her. She just excused herself, and she wondered if the welcome party had been prepared by whom. Altair again glared at her and said that he had clearly told her. She got confused there, and then he went from there. Nadia then relaxed that he had gone from there. She felt so relieved and thought that in a novel, he would be generous enough to forgive her if she apologized, but if she had to do that all the time, her knees would be a wreck. And she wondered if she should make herself some new protectors. Just as the door opened, Nadia wondered if he had come again. But a maid came inside and asked Nadia what she was doing on the floor. Nadia replied that the carpet was so nice. And by standing, she mentioned that it would be nice if the carpet were softer and more cushiony. The maid became happy and said that Nadia thought the same as well. And she certainly agreed to buy not only the carpet but also the curtains, bedding, and all the other things the castle needed refurbishing. She then placed a small water tub on the table introducing herself as Anna and stating that she was there to serve Nadia. Fable had told her to do so Fable was the one who managed the castle, and he had told her to come and help Nadia. Nadia thought that she hadn't seen such a maid earlier. The scene shifted after 30 minutes, and Anna was still talking about lots of things, and Nadia was so worn out. Anna said that they were always talking about practicality, and they said that it was better to buy the food rather than refurbish the place. Nadia thought of Baron Beggar and thought that if his room was like that, she wouldn't even have to look at the outside of the house, and there was so little decoration. And that was only one fact out of all the rumors Melly told her. Anna told Nadia that she was so happy Nadia was there, and Anna was sure that Nadia knew all about what was sophisticated. Nadia thought of the role of a baroness, and she had never really thought about that. She was sure Altair didn't get married out of boredom. If what he wanted was for her to play the role of the lady of the house, then she was confident she could do it to his liking. With what she had learned in that Vine family, and with added knowledge of her past life, she was sure she could make that work somehow. But in the novel, Altair was a bachelor baron. She could understand, judging by the state of the barony, that no young woman would want to come live there. And since he always had that bloodthirsty look on his face, no one dared to come closer to him. So the baroness was an unknown factor that wasn't taken into account in the novel, or in other words, things would change as she took action. First, she needed to stop being frightened whenever she saw Altair. She then opened the door and realized it was so silent because no one was there. Anna told her to rest, but Nadia came out of her room because she was feeling nervous staying there. 
As she walked, she wished that she could meet someone there and wondered if the castle people all walked around without issues even though it was dark. Nadia saw that Anna wasn't exaggerating when she said that the entire castle needed to be revamped. She then felt something soft and squishy, so she wondered what that was. It was black but wasn't like the wall. She tapped on it and confirmed that it wasn't a floor and wondered what could be so soft. Altair asked her what she was doing. She was surprised there, and he asked her again what she was doing there. She recognized the voice and realized it was Altair standing in front of her. She then wondered what the thing she was groping was, and as she was heading back, her leg turned, so she was about to fall. Altair grabbed her hand and hugged her, asking why she was moving around on her own and if she was planning to run away from there. She denied that and made her hand free, stating that she wasn't going to run away because she had come there of her own accord, so she would never run away. She thought that he might take responsibility for the choices he made. She chose what she thought was the best decision, so it was time to be responsible for that. She told him that she didn't yet know what he was expecting from his wife, but even so, she would try her best not to disappoint him. And she knew a lot more than he might think, and if he told her what she needed to do, she would try her best. Altair wondered what exactly made her say such things, and if she knew what he wanted. Then he told her to do something about calling him their lord. She pardoned him and said that others called him like that, and if not my lord, what should she call him? Altair stood, not telling her that she knew more than he thought, and questioned whether she should be able to figure that out by herself. She agreed, thinking it was like a test to see if he could entrust her with the role he desired. Then she promised that she would find out, and if she did, he would tell her what he wanted. As he agreed, she promised to do her best for that. However, Altair grabbed his head and stated that he guaranteed she had no idea what he wanted. She replied that she didn't know, but she could still learn by reading books or talking to people who had some idea. He was surprised to hear that she would ask people who had an idea. She couldn't see anything once the sun set, and he decided to have the butler show her around the castle the next day, and on the way back, she was confused. But he suddenly lifted her and began to carry her away. She asked what he was doing all of a sudden. He replied that he had never seen her act so lovely until then. She asked him to just put her down. Altair told her that it was too dark for her to find her way back to her room alone. She retorted that if she couldn't, then neither could he. He responded that he could see and continued walking while carrying her. She argued that even if she couldn't see, she could fumble around. Altair asked what if she fell and broke her bone. She replied that she wouldn't, and who breaks their bones just from falling. He stated that normal people didn't, but she was an exception and since she had once passed out due to fatigue, and he couldn't stand the sight of someone getting hurt, she should stop flapping around like that. She thought that she was totally normal at that time, and she was the odd one in his common sense. After all that, she sat in front of the mirror and tapped on it, thinking that Altair couldn't stand the sight of someone getting hurt in his castle, and as a newbie villain, his dialogues were quite dramatic. Just then, the door opened, and Anna came in calling for Nadia. Nadia stated that Anna startled her and requested that she should knock on the door next time. Anna apologized and said that it was time for Nadia to go. Nadia inquired where she should go, and Anna replied that she should go to the dinner party where everyone was waiting for her. Nadia remembered that Altair had told her she would be in trouble if she didn't come, and she had completely forgotten about it. She realized that if she were late, Altair would give her the death stare again, which she couldn't afford when nothing had even been accomplished yet. Nadia then asked Anna if she could help her get ready. Anna agreed and began searching for powder and a corset. However, Nadia said that she would go as she was currently. Anna was shocked and thought it was unexpected. Nadia thought that she needed to watch her behavior at dinner. The scene shifted to the dinner party where everyone was enjoying the meal. A man with a drink commented that there was something wrong with the new baroness. The person sitting across from him was shocked and asked what he meant. Altair sat there hearing their words. Kane had said that if they were talking about Nadia's health, so be it. But just then the first man stopped him and told him to just listen to him. Kane asked if that was not a baby, so he should tell him. The man said to think of where Aylesford was situated. Kane asked why he was changing the topic and mentioned that they were at the eastern end of the empire. The man said that it was right, and in different words, it was the rural backwater. They were known for being poor, but Nadia was from the capital, a daughter of the Marquises, and more importantly, as they knew that Altair's reaction was always the same in all moods, so they were expecting someone who was muted or disabled. But the bride they saw at the wedding was so unexpected. Yet, she still hadn't broken off the marriage, even after seeing Altair drenched in blood at the wedding. So didn't Cain find that strange? So he wondered if there was something wrong with her. And she seemed physically fine. Maybe she had an ulterior motive. Cain wondered if there were ulterior motives and thought that Valhale could have sent her there. 
but no, it might be connected but not enough to control the Marquess. Then he said that it was so ridiculous and there wasn't anything to gain there. The man agreed with him and said that he had never seen Nadia pass out so gracefully. The Baroness was an angel sent to Aylesford, so let's all pray for Aylesford. Then they all began to cry. Cain stood and asked to be allowed to sing a song to welcome Nadia. He then started singing a song. Nadia wondered if that was how a general felt going to war. Once she opened that door and went in, she would see Altair. Anna asked Nadia if she should open the door. Nadia thought to herself to get a grip and promised not to get nervous. From that moment on, she would not be nervous. However, she felt scared, and if she entered like that, it would be the same as at breakfast time, so she wondered what she should do. Then she heard someone singing from the other side of the door. Nadia thought the man was so bad at singing, but thanks to that, she felt a bit more relaxed that time. She then signaled to Anna to open the door. As the door opened, Nadia entered, and all the people turned their faces and fell silent, looking at her. Altair just glared at her. Nadia was so scared there and thought that she knew they all worked for a villain, but she felt so scared by the way they were looking at her. Some of them thought Nadia was as pretty as an angel. Nadia thought that Altair was the scariest of them all, and he was glaring at her because she was late, but she wasn't late. Anna asked Nadia to sit there. As Nadia sat, she thought that she would be criticized for being late. Anna served her food and said that it was prepared by them and that it was the traditional meal of the East. Nadia wondered if Altair wasn't upset, and if it was because she had told him she would try her best before. Anna told Nadia that it was chicken marinated with various spices and tomato stew, and she was sure Nadia would like it. Nadia thanked Anna for that, and as she saw Altair's earrings, she thought that if he was silent, it was fine for her to eat. They started having the meal. There was a whole chicken in front of Nadia, and she wondered how she would eat that whole thing. Yet she noticed they were all eating with their hands and it seemed tasty. She wanted to eat like that as well, but because of the etiquette she had learned as a noble, she refrained. Just as she was about to eat what was in front of her, Altair asked for and took it. She was shocked and thought that she wanted to eat that. And was he taking it because she was late? She considered him to be a real villain. Altair then gave her a different plate full of food, and she was confused to see that. He asked if she wasn't going to eat that. She agreed, and then they began to eat. She wondered what had happened suddenly. 